All right. Um, chapter four, we started talking about the atom. We talked about last time, really, some uh, important experiments that led to the structure of the atom. Uh, we had really, uh, we had Dalton's atomic theory. Uh, we uh, then had some a lot of experiments that really explored electrons involved the CRT uh, tubes, the cathode ray tubes, and Thompson. We had uh, Milligan and the oil drop experiment. which led to a better understanding, obviously, of these two, of the uh, mass of an electron, the 9.09 .09 times 10 to the minus 28 grams. Um, that led to sort of an early model of the atom, which was the plum pudding model. And that was the spherical model where the positive charge was spread out and embedded inside were the electrons. And this is sort of the accepted model of the atom until the next really major sort of experiment, which was the gold foil experiment. And that was done by Rutherford. And he shot alpha particles at pieces of gold foil and other metals. And based on the sort of the plum pudding model, they expected them to go through with some uh, deflection occurring because they're heavy, they're positively charged, they're going through sort of a positive gel. And they would think that, you know, they would be able to kind of go through, but there would be some deflection that would occur. And what he actually found when he did the experiment, as we talked about, is pretty much most of them sailed through with really no problem, the alpha particles that he shot. Uh, but he did see that every so often the uh, alpha particles would bounce off at these really sort of large angles. And as we talked about, what that meant was they really had to sort of abandon this model of the atom and sort of come up with really sort of the modern version of the atom uh, where the atom is mostly empty space. Also has a very positive core, uh, which is the nucleus. And that accounted for all those alpha particles which are positively charged being bounced off at these really large angles. And the other thing was that the uh, most of the mass of the atom uh, was the nucleus. And that's because later experiments, as we talked about, uh, show that the existence of protons and neutrons. And they both are about 1,800 times heavier uh, than any electron that's moving around. And they both are found in the nucleus of the atom. So in the nucleus of the atom, uh, we have our protons, we have our neutrons. And moving sort of randomly about the nucleus is our electrons in that empty space. And again, uh, that is really our version here of the atom. Any questions on that there? All right. So this is sort of that uh, view of uh, the atom. Again, this sort of red spot here is really the empty space and really where our electrons are moving about. Um, here's our nucleus where our protons and neutrons would be housed. And it's very small compared to the overall size of the atom and the atom itself is relatively small as well. Uh, this is what is sometimes referred to as electron density sort of map kind of the darker pink areas is a higher probability of finding electrons and kind of the lighter pink as it kind of fades out, a lower probability of finding an electron. As we also talked about, opposites attract. So there is definitely some attraction between the negative electrons and really the positive nucleus, uh, but uh, it is traveling randomly as we'll talk about in the next chapter, uh, those electrons about the nucleus. <clears throat> Thank you. So here again, just a reminder, electrons negatively charged, traveling in that empty space, protons positively charged, neutrons have no charge. And again, uh, in terms of relationship, protons and neutrons are much heavier than the electron. And really it's the neutron that just barely edges out the proton in terms of the heaviest of the three different uh, subatomic particles. So most of the chemistry of atoms comes from electrons. 
as pretty much what happens when we do have a chemical reaction that takes place, as we talked about, I think, uh, when we did chemical changes, is really the only thing that happens is we break all the bonds between all the atoms and we reform all the bonds. Uh, so basically, that's all basically electrons and breaking and making bonds. Uh, there are really involved when they come together in chemical reactions uh, to form different sort of compounds. So let's talk a little bit about some other aspects of atoms, and that's the atomic number, the mass number, and isotopes. First, we'll start with the atomic number. So <clears throat> the atomic number, which is sometimes abbreviated as a Z, the definition of the atomic number is the number of protons there are in each atom of an element. So if an atom is neutral and protons are positive, uh, in a neutral atom, the atomic number will also tell you how many electrons there would be because you need equal number of negative charges to balance out the positive charges. Now, <clears throat> when we look at the periodic table, bless you, uh, in a neutral atom, yeah, yeah, in a neutral atom, yeah. So if we look on the periodic table, the atomic number is actually found there. It is the number that we see on the top of the symbol. Uh, so for example, hydrogen is one. A lot of times it's right above it or just above to the right. Um, that is the atomic number. Now it is important to understand and remember this, that uh, the definition of the atomic number is actually only the number of protons. So the actual definition of atomic number is just the number of protons. Separate to that is in a neutral atom, it will also tell you how many electrons. So if you're ever asked what the definition of the atomic number is, it is just the number of protons, not electrons, so just the number of protons. As we'll talk about, not in all cases will they equal the same number. <clears throat> If you look at the periodic table and you look at all the numbers that you see above the symbols, there is no number that repeats. So every single element has its own atomic number, has its own number of protons. So frankly, if you know the atomic number, which is the number of protons, are the number of protons, you can use a periodic table and know exactly what element you're talking about. Uh, so, for example, there, if we look, uh, we got carbon, which is six, I believe. Hopefully, they haven't changed that. So, it can only be carbon that has six protons. You'll never find an oxygen with six protons because an oxygen should have eight protons. So, if you change the number of protons, you change what element it is, and um, every single one can be identified by the atomic number or the number of protons. So as we see here in the example there, uh, if we had nitrogen, we go to the periodic table and above nitrogen is seven. And that means that in a neutral nitrogen atom, it would have seven protons, which are positively charged. And because it's neutral, it would need to have the exact same number of electrons to balance it out and end up with basically no charge. Yeah. So the deal with those is, and we'll talk about it, I think actually maybe in this chapter, but um, if you follow the numbers here, I'm going to reach over here. Uh, 57 is LA uh, with his lanthanide, and LA is, uh, should go there, but the rest of the numbers that actually go there um, are that row. And then 89 is the same thing, that's actinide. The rest of the elements that should actually go there are there. This room doesn't have it. Actually, the other room down the hall that has it. Um, but technically, those two rows should actually go right about there and push everybody else to the right. And so that's why the numbering kind of goes that way. So that particular spot there, uh, 57 would be LA, and LU would be 71 would be its atomic number. <clears throat> other questions? Oh, no. no, yeah. Yeah, so they are they are similar. So uh, when we get to the periodic table, we will talk about it. But um, the reason is uh, <clears throat> logical reasons as well. Make the periodic table too wide. Yeah, and they took those sort of rows down uh, because they do uh, share similar uh, similarities. 
a lot of those guys on the bottom row are radioactive. A lot of them on the bottom row as well are like the man-made sort of elements. So that's where they kind of placed all those guys and on the bottom. Yeah. <clears throat> Other questions? E yeah, we'll, we'll get to all that, yeah. yeah. All right, another important uh, aspect of an atom is what's known as the mass number. And the mass number is sometimes abbreviated with an A. Uh, it is the total number of neutrons and protons there are in an atom. So except for hydrogen, uh, Every element has protons, electrons, and neutrons. Um, hydrogen only has a proton and electron. It does not have a neutron, but everybody else will have all three of those things. Why the mass number is important, if we take the mass number, which is our protons and neutrons, and we take our atomic number that we just talked about, which is our number of protons, and we subtract them, that is how we can find the number of neutrons. So if you take the mass number minus the atomic number, that will tell you how many neutrons there are in an atom. When you calculate these things, uh, when you calculate uh, the mass number, the atomic number, the number of protons, number of electrons, and the number of neutrons, uh, they do all have to be positive whole numbers. Um, <clears throat> and there shouldn't be any of those things. So now when we go to the periodic table and we look, for example, under hydrogen here, 1.008, is the mass number on the periodic table, is that the mass number? The answer is it is not the mass number because the mass number, the atomic number, and all those things need to be whole numbers. So if you look at all those numbers that are on the bottom of the symbol on the periodic table, including the ones that are in parentheses and all those good things, uh, they're pretty much none of them are whole numbers. So what that is on the bottom of the tables is what we'll talk about as well, but this is the atomic mass. And it is not the mass number. So what confuses people sometimes is the numbers are very, very close to each other, uh, but it does need to be a uh, whole number. So if you're asked to calculate the mass number, you'll be given enough information within the problem to be able to calculate it, and it should be a whole number. Do not write the number that's on the periodic table underneath it for the mass number, because uh, it definitely will be wrong. The atomic mass is really the mass of uh, <clears throat> the protons, electrons, and neutrons, and it's actually the average atomic mass is what we see on the bottom there. And that is uh, of all the naturally occurring isotopes for these different elements. Any questions on that there? So what are isotopes? Isotopes are the same element, uh, but they do have different masses. So remember, this is really what sort of violated one of uh, Dalton's atomic theory, where he said that all atoms of the same element are identical. And the existence of isotopes sort of disproves that. Um, so, for example, hydrogen has one proton and no neutrons. And once again, hydrogen is the only element that does not have a neutron. Uh, everybody else will. Deuterium, which is sometimes referred to as heavy hydrogen, has one proton and one neutron. And tritium, which is like the radioactive version of hydrogen, um, has one proton and two neutrons. So atoms that have the same atomic number but have different mass numbers, which means they have different numbers of neutrons, are referred to as isotopes. A very common way that we write isotopes is like the formula that we see down here. We use the chemical symbol, and top left goes the mass number. Bottom left there goes the atomic number. So for example, if we were to write the symbol here for hydrogen, and maybe you didn't know hydrogen there on the periodic table, but once you see one proton, that means that is the atomic number. You go and find number one up on the periodic table, and number one is hydrogen or H. The atomic number would go on the bottom. In this case, our mass number would be one plus zero equals one, which would be one, and that would be the symbol for hydrogen. 
Again, if you take the top number minus the bottom number, it gives you the number of neutrons. So in this case, one minus one gives you zero. Now, if you went to deuterium and didn't really know what that was, but if they told you it had one proton, once again, that would be the atomic number. So you would go to the periodic table and find number one, and it would still be H. In this case, though, there is one proton and one neutron, which means the mass number would be two. So that would be the correct symbol there for deuterium. Again, taking the top number there, two minus one gives us one neutron that is present. And lastly, if you were new, this was tritium, but wasn't sure what element was. Once again, when you see one proton, that will tell you the atomic number is one. So it's still hydrogen is the symbol. And now here we have one plus two, which is three for our mass number. And that would be the symbol for deuterium. So although they have three different names, uh, they're all the same element. They're all a hydrogen, but they all do have different masses because they each contain different numbers of neutrons in this case. Any questions on that? So that's a very common way that we write these things. By the way, another common way that we sometimes will see things written is say something like this, Cu-64. And in this particular case, <clears throat> that is copper. If you had to take a guess, do you think the 64 is the atomic number or the mass number? It is the mass number, and we know that because if we go to the periodic table and find copper, the number above it is 29, right? And that 29 would be the atomic number, and that would then make this the mass number. So that's a very common way. And if we were to convert that into the other form, be copper 64 up on top and 29 on the bottom, and that would mean copper here would have how many neutrons? It would be 35, 64 minus 29 there would give you 35 neutrons. Any questions on that? Then? <clears throat> okay, so you obviously uh, need to know how to write these symbols, figure out the mass number, the atomic number, protons, electrons, and neutrons. So let's try some here. Uh, let's take a look. All right, for each of these, take a moment here and how many protons, electrons, and neutrons do we have? Okay, let's take a look here. So once again, up on top is going to be our mass number. On the bottom here will be our atomic number. So in this case, uh, cobalt, which is CO, number of protons should be 27. Now we know this is neutral and just so you, you know why it's neutral. When we look here, we do not see anything. Uh, we do not see any type of charge or anything written there. So we can assume that it is neutral, which means if it has 27 uh, protons, the number of electrons, which are negatively charged, should equal the same, right? So 27 positives and 27 negatives gives us no charge overall. Now the number of neutrons here, once again, going to be our mass number minus our atomic number. And that looks like 33. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> Looking at this one here, this is chlorine. Once again, nothing written there. So it has no charge. So we're going to look at the bottom, which would be our atomic number. That's going to give us the number of protons, which would be 17. Once again, because it is neutral, it has to have an equal number. And lastly, here we want our number of neutrons, uh, which would be 37 minus 17. And I hope that's 20 at that point. Yeah. Any questions on that one? <laughs> on the bottom here is uranium. Uh, which is U. Once again, we do not see anything written there, so we could assume that it is neutral. And looking at our number of protons will equal our atomic number, uh, which in this case is 92. Having a matching number of electrons to give us no charge. 
And in this case, our number of neutrons taking the mass number, which is 238 minus 92. That seems like a lot, like a buck 46, hopefully. Something like that. I don't... Any questions on any of those there? <clears throat> so again, very common mistake people make is, you know, not figuring out the number of neutrons or the mass number really, and just kind of taking that number from the periodic table, which again is incorrect. All right, let's try a couple more here. In this case, let's write some symbols with the mass number. All right, let's take a look. Uh, so we'll start with the symbol there. Krypton is KR, I hope. So KR is our symbol. Once again, if we go and look at KR, an important number that we could get is the number above it, which is the atomic number, and that is 36. So that should go bottom left there of our symbol. We are given the number of neutrons, and remember that this 36 will also be the number of protons. So our mass number can be found by adding those together, 48 plus 36, 84. And that should be our symbol there, yeah. Any questions on that one? Doing the same thing there for... Yeah, so again, that number on the bottom is not the mass number. So that's the atomic number. So this is definitely how you want to calculate the um, the mass numbers to use that information. You'll be you'll be given enough information to be able to do that from the problem. Yeah, definitely don't use that number on the periodic table for the mass number. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. So if we go uh, for nitrogen, the symbol is N. Once again, if we look up N, we will see a 7 above it. And that would be our atomic number, which should go bottom left. That also tells us the number of protons. So once again, here we could calculate our mass number. Uh, that's seven plus six neutrons, 13, I think here. So that is a 13. <clears throat> so again, just to touch on that point, again, you don't want to use that number on the bottom because again, if you look at something like nitrogen, it is 1401. So if you round it to 14, definitely would be wrong. Yeah, so again, atomic mass, uh, mass number calculated like we're doing here. Lastly, it's iron, uh, which is Fe. And if we look at the periodic table for iron, I think it's 26, isn't it? So once again, that is going to be our atomic number, which is 26. In this case, it actually gave us the mass number, which was 56. And that means uh, we also want to know protons, electrons, and neutrons in this guy. Uh, so this guy would be protons would be 26. Electrons, because there is no charge, uh, would also be 26. Gives us zero. And our neutrons would be 56 minus 26. Mass number minus atomic number, which would give us 30 in this case. <clears throat> Any questions on any of those there? So why don't we take a moment here and talk about what would happen if we did have charges? So if we had something that had charges, you know, what would it affect? When we do have something that has charges, uh, they are referred to as ions. There's really two types of ions. There are cations, which are positively charged, and there's anions which are negatively charged. <clears throat> so these are things that obviously do have charges and we do have to adjust some things uh, when we do run across those uh, situation. So for example here, clear up some room here maybe. All right, so we'll start with, say, the nitrogen here. So the nitrogen that we just did here with no charge, nothing written there, uh, basically has seven protons. 
and seven electrons. And obviously has no charge, which is why, again, there's nothing written. And in terms of neutrons, it has our six, right? Our 13 minus seven. Now, if we have the same guy here, but it had a minus three charge, which would make it an anion because it has a negative charge. We would look at this and it would have seven for his protons. Now, electrons would have how many in this case? Electrons in this case would be 10 electrons, yeah. Seven positives and 10 negatives leaves you a negative three left over. And that is the charge that we see there. So in this case, because it has a negative three charge, it actually has more electrons than protons, which is why it does have a negative three overall charge. Why would we not change the number of protons? What happens if I just decided I want to make it like, I don't know, four protons and seven electrons? Yeah. If I did that and I changed it to four protons or said it had four protons, we're no longer talking about nitrogen. We would be talking about beryllium. So remember, the protons is the most important thing. It basically determines what element you're dealing with. So when somebody gets a charge, really the only thing that changes is the number of electrons. In this particular case, it actually gained electrons from the neutral. So our guy here had seven electrons and this guy had 10. So the actual charge tells you kind of what's going on. The negative charge means it gained electrons. And the actual number of the charge is how many electrons it gained from the neutral guy. So our neutral guy has seven, the gain the minus three charge, it actually gained three electrons. So it has 10 electrons. Now, what happens if we had something like our iron here, 56, 26, and plus two in this case. Number of protons for this guy would be how many? 26. And number of electrons here would be, it would be 24. 26 positives, 24 negatives leaves me a plus two left over, which once again is where the charge comes from. And in this case, uh, we wouldn't change the protons for the same reasoning. But what we see here is it actually has two less electrons than the neutral guy. And that's what happens with cations. They actually lose electrons. And the number is how many they lost from the neutral. So plus two means it lost two electrons. So instead of 26, it has 24. So when somebody gains a charge, Typically, the only thing that should change is the number of electrons. And if it is a positive charge, they have lost electrons equal to the charge. And if it's a negative charge, then they have gained electrons equal to the charge. And that is our anions and cations. Typically speaking, metals are the ones that lay up the electrons and lose them. And nonmetals are typically the ones that will gain electrons. Any questions on that there? Yeah, so it, basically the only things that have charges right in an atom are protons and neutrons are neutral, so they don't affect the charge at all. So protons, which are positively charged, and electrons, which are negatively charged, are the only things that could actually affect the charge. The other thing is because the atomic number for nitrogen, for example, is seven, nitrogen cannot be anything else but seven for its atomic number, which is how many protons it has. So basically what that means is we kind of have to lock in seven positive charges for nitrogen. We can't have any more or any less. Otherwise, it wouldn't be nitrogen. So because that's plus seven, it kind of becomes like a math problem. It, you basically need to end up with a negative three. And basically, if you had seven electrons, it would equal zero. Then if you had one more electron, you now have negative one, right? If you had one more, negative two, and one more, negative three. So seven and three is basically 10. 
And that's how come we need that. So basically, this guy has 10 negative charges from the electron, only seven positive charges. So basically, uh, if you subtract those two, that gives you three, which is the charge that we see there. Same thing here. In this case, the charge is plus two. So the iron has to have 26 positive charges no matter what. So in this case, we actually only need 24 negative charges to subtract from that. And that leaves us a plus two left over basically for the charge. Yeah. I, I missed the first part. What, what happens is what happens to the charge? What if that was like the charge of the current? Yeah. The like the two plus instead of two liquids that was on the uh stable. Yeah, you probably wouldn't have something like that. So common charges for most things aren't super large. So, um, you know, plus two, plus three are very, very common. Plus ones, minus ones, um, you know, up to four. But yeah, you, it, it, probably would, it probably wouldn't have uh, lost the 100 electrons because it would need more than 100 electrons to still be in business. Um, and nobody up there has too many have over 100 electrons so it probably wouldn't happen in most cases other questions because <clears throat> remember starting wise everybody on the periodic table right neutral which means starting wise they basically have an equal number of electrons to their atomic number so it would take something that has a lot of protons to start with that yeah other questions all right so why don't you try some here let's do um let us do chromium that has a plus four charge, speaking of larger charges. And let's do, uh, let's do a chlorine that has a minus one charge. How many protons, electrons, and neutrons in each of these? So I guess I'll give you some numbers. Uh, let's, do, let's do 54. And let's do... 37 on that one. All right, protons, electrons, and neutrons for each of these guys. So once again, we would want to go to the periodic table and find these two guys and kind of drew it there for you. So that's what we'll see on the periodic table. Again, that's going to provide us our atomic number, which would be important. So for chromium, it's going to be 24. And for chlorine, as we saw, I think earlier, it would be 17 in this case. Now we have basically our mass number and our atomic number, which will allow us to really uh, answer everything that we need. So starting with our chromium, we'll go this way. Uh, we have 24 protons. In this particular case, it does have a plus four charge. So once again, the plus means that it lost or gained electrons. Lost. Yeah, so plus means that it lost and four means that it lost basically four electrons. So we know in a neutral guy, it would have 24 electrons. So 24 minus four is 20 electrons it should have in this case. So this would have 20 electrons. So 20 positives, 24, sorry, 24 positives and 20 negatives leaves us a plus four left over, uh, which again is where the charge comes from. And our number of neutrons on this guy would be 54 minus 24. And that looks like a 30 in this case. Question on that one then. <clears throat> Coming over here to the chloride, which has a negative one charge. Once again, our atomic number from the periodic table tells us that the number of protons would be 17. Because it has a negative charge, that means that it gained electrons. And really, that's a negative one charge. So if there's no number written, it's one. And that means that in a neutral chlorine, the atomic number would tell us that it has 17 protons and electrons. And because it gained one, it, this guy should have 18 electrons, right? Giving us the negative one charge. And our number of neutrons here would be 37 minus 17, uh, which would be 20 in this case. Any questions on those? Uh, <clears throat> all right. 
So obviously you need to be able to write these symbols. I uh, need to be able to figure out how many protons, electrons, and neutrons there are in both neutral and things with charges. Yeah, any questions on that? <clears throat> So as I mentioned before, as we saw, isotopes um, are really the same element, but they do have different numbers of neutrons. Um, pretty much most of normal chemical reactions, uh, as we talked about, basically involve just the electrons, the breaking and making bonds. Really, neutrons do not participate uh, in normal chemical reactions. Only like nuclear reactions they kind of participate in, but in normal chemical reactions, they do not. Uh, and one of the nice sort of aspects, for example, of um, isotopes are a lot of elements do have radioactive versions of isotopes. So if you're doing some type of research, for example, and maybe you want to know what's happening with, say, copper in a situation, you could use a radioactive version of copper. It'll do pretty much all the same chemistry as the normal copper would do this non-radioactive. Uh, but because it's radioactive, you can really follow where all the copper ends up and where it's going throughout sort of a process. Uh, so a lot of times radioactive versions of isotopes are used in research to follow particular elements by following basically the radioactivity. Obviously in medicine, they're also used for treating and imaging um, in different situations. So let's talk a little bit about the periodic table. That's the periodic table there. Whoops, good thought. So the periodic table uh, gives a great deal of uh, information. Um, and that is what it looks like. And there's some different parts to the periodic table we're going to talk about. So let's talk about these different parts of it. First off, there are elements in a column or is what's referred to as a group. Not too many people use family anymore, but uh, you just go to use use family as well. But groups are what they usually refer to. So groups go up and down. Yes. Yeah? So groups go this away on the periodic table. And when we talk about the numbering of the groups, depending on the periodic table, you will see a bunch of different numbering. Uh, for example, there up there has got some numbering up here. We have 1A numbering. Uh, we have regular numbering up to like 18. Some periodic tables will have some B numbering up there with some Bs. We typically use the A numbering, which is the representative numbering in pretty much all your chemistry classes. So what that means is group one is here. Group two is here, and then we skip everybody. And this is group three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So that is the correct numbering that we use in chemistry. Most people don't call it like 1A, 2A. Most people just call it group one, group two, group three, and so forth. So basically first group, second group, skip the middle four, five, six, seven, and eight as you go across there. By the way, even though hydrogen is sitting here, it is actually not part of group one. Uh, group one actually starts with lithium. So lithium is actually the start of group one, even though on most periodic tables, hydrogen is kind of hanging out over there. Uh, it's actually not part of it. And we'll talk about why that is in just a bit here. There's also periods and periods on the periodic table go left to right. And there's usually seven periods uh, that does start up here. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Again, all heading in that direction. <clears throat> the number on the top of the symbol, as we've been talking about, is the atomic number, which, as we know, is the number of protons there are. And as we talked about it earlier, again, there are really no numbering uh, that repeats. So every element will have its own atomic number or its own number of protons. Now the periodic table is broken up really into sort of three categories on most periodic tables. You can kind of see what this is sometimes referred to as a staircase right there, it kind of comes down. And to the left of the staircase are metals. To the upper right of the staircase are non-metals. And on the staircase there, and some people include boron as well, uh, are what are sometimes referred to as metal voids or semi-metals. And that's sort of your dividing line as well. The uh, two rows on the bottom that we were talking about earlier, I'll just kind of draw them down here. Those are also metals down there. So those 
are also metals, those two rows that we were talking about earlier. <clears throat> so one reason why hydrogen is not part of group one is hydrogen is this guy. Hydrogen is a metal or non-metal or a metal oil. Hydrogen is a non-metal, yeah? So even though it's hanging out over there on top of all the metals, that's why it's really not part of group one, which are all metals. So hydrogen is hanging out there because it has some unusual properties. It kind of acts like a metal in some cases, uh, but it is a non-metal. We don't have too many hanging around here anymore in periodic tables, but on old periodic tables, they would actually put hydrogen on both sides and you'd find it over there as well in a lot of periodic tables. Uh, but they usually don't print them like that too much anymore. Uh, some characteristics of metals, as we might have talked about a little bit earlier when we were doing that lab, uh, they are good conductors of heat and electricity. They're also malleable. You could hammer them into thin sheets. You can pull them into wires. They typically do have a shiny appearance. Pretty much all metals are room temperature. Uh, all metals are solids at room temperature. Uh, the one exception is mercury, which is why mercury usually is a different color on most periodic tables, which is HG up there. Uh, right around 80 and that is a liquid but pretty much all other metals are solids at room temperature now non-metals pretty much have the opposite sort of characteristics of metals uh, they are usually poor conductors of heat and electricity they also have a more variety of states that you find it uh, nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, those are gases. Bromine is a liquid. Carbon and sulfur are solids. A lot of nonmetals are those diatomic molecules that we talked about in terms of elements like H2, N2, O2, Cl2, F2, Br2, I2. So a lot of those sort of guys are those elements that come as diatomic molecules. Uh, are non-metals, and again, a lot of them are gases as well. Now, the metalloids, uh, which are also sometimes referred to as semi-metals, again, although nowadays most people kind of roll with metalloids instead of semi-metals, but uh, they are the same. Uh, they actually have characteristics that do fall sort of on both sides of it. So really to the the left here, we got metals. Upper right, we got non-metals. And metalloids, which kind of sit in the middle of the two, uh, the elements there have certain characteristics that are very similar to what we see in metals. And the same element will have characteristics that are similar to what we see in non-metals. So it kind of makes sense of where they're kind of located um, on the periodic table. Now, some elements or groups uh, do have specific names. So starting with group one, that is the alkali metals. So once again, that is starting with lithium and coming down, not hydrogen. That would be group one, which is the alkali metals. Group two with beryllium and down are the alkaline earth metals. The word alkaline means basic. And a lot of our strong bases like sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, uh, they actually come from group one and group two on the periodic table. So a lot of strong bases uh, come from there. Group seven over here are fluorine, chlorine, and so forth. Those are the halogens. And next door is group eight, uh, which is the noble gases or helium. Our neon, our argon, all of our ons are there. So you do need to know the specific names of these groups and where they are located on the periodic table. Any questions on that there? Now, halogens, as I mentioned before, are very reactive. We're going to see that in an experiment, I think, coming up. Um, and they also, as I talked about, are a lot of those diatomic ones. So fluorine is a pale yellow gas. Chlorine is a deadly green gas there as well. Bromine, kind of a liquid. Iodine, we kind of saw that purple in that experiment we did the other week. Uh, so we saw that, obviously, when it went into the gas phase as well. They typically will also make some acids, as we'll talk about in a later chapter, how we get hydrochloric acid, hydrofluoric acid, hydrobromic acid. Um, so they're very sort of reactive. <clears throat> Noble gases, which is that group eight, 
Again, there's sometimes years ago called uh, rare gases. Noble gases means they are sort of a group set apart. They are pretty much chemically inert. So group eight noble gases pretty much are unreactive. They won't react with anything except for themselves, but they really won't react with anything else. Um, so they are sometimes produced chemically inert. Uh, there's also some noble metals, things like gold and, and those type of metals, uh, which are very unreactive as well. The two rows that we were talking about earlier are referred to as lanthanides and actinides. And that is because, as we talked about, they should go right about there on the periodic table. So those two rows, and again, if you follow the numbering, should go up into that spot. And um, they are still metals because that's basically metals in that range. And as we talked about, for the most part, there's a lot of radioactive elements there, man-made elements, things like Einsteinium, Nobelium, all those kind of guys kind of find their way down that way. Um, but uh, Otherwise, your periodic table will be quite wide if they kind of put it in there. The metals that are between group two and group three, so these guys here, these are the transition metals. And transition metals, as we will talk about, are metals that really have sort of the capability of making multiple types of charges. Uh, so they can make a variable type of charges. The two rows on the bottom, because they actually do go in that spot, these two guys here, they're also sometimes referred to as the inner transition metals. Because technically speaking, they should kind of be slapped right there in that spot. Any questions on anything there on the periodic table? <clears throat> So characteristic shape of the periodic table originally devised uh, to put elements that have similar properties together. And they did a really good job. They left holes in it and, and kind of filled it in as the time went on. But things that are in the same group, uh, things even kind of in the same period, uh, do share similar sort of characteristics. Um, and obviously, as we go from kind of left to right on the periodic table, we're going from more metal to more non-metal as we kind of go to the right and up on the periodic table. So you do need to, as I mentioned, you do need to be able to uh, know all the parts of the periodic table, groups, periods, which way they go, the correct numbering for the groups, the specific names of the different groups, where transition metals are and all those things, where things are uh, metals, non-metals, and metalloids. Any question on periodic table? <clears throat> yeah. So as I mentioned before, the uh, noble gases are pretty much those kind of unreactive guys. There are some metals, uh, gold, silver, platinum, which are noble metals. And they, again, are very unreactive. Um, it takes a lot for any of those things to react and they pretty much do not. By the way, gold, silver, that is like this area right here. All those guys right there are noble metals. All right. A lot of the uh, noble gases are what are referred to as well as being monoatomic. Uh, monoatomic, meaning that they come as ones. So unlike hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and some of those chlorines or fluorines that come as twos, diatomic molecules, most of the uh, noble gases come as monoatomic or one atom, basically. All right, so we hit those guys, I think. All right, and a table about some of those characteristics we talked about. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, some structures of, whoops, come back, of solid non-metallic elements. Uh, they are a little bit different than metals. Um, different forms of the same element are what are called allotropes. So if you have an allotrope or something, uh, that's basically the same element, but some different forms of it. Example is carbon. There's several different forms of carbon. Uh, there's diamond, there's graphite, and there's fullerens. Uh, depending on which one you give, you get a different response. But, you know, you could say, hey, the pencil lead is carbon. It's just as good as the diamond. Maybe that wouldn't have worked yesterday. I don't know. Uh, but this is the shape of a diamond. 
and it's kind of the carbons arranged differently in graphite, which is carbon. They're basically arranged in sort of sheets, uh, but they're ultimately both still carbon. Uh, just really they're different arrangements uh, as to why they kind of look and have some different properties, obviously, and different price points as well. So we talked a little bit about ions just to kind of finish up talking about those guys as well. So as I mentioned, an atom um, that has basically no charge is neutral. And that really does mean that it does have an equal number of protons and electrons. Once again, anything that has a charge, either a positive or negative charge uh, is an ion. And example, sodium has 11 electrons, but again, sodium will typically lose one electron when it does, and it will be sodium with a plus one charge. One way you could represent sodium losing an electron is to write a little equation such as this. So basically the idea here is we have sodium that has no charge. Then when the sodium actually loses a charge, the electron comes off, it becomes positive one. And this is showing the electron on the product side. So if you need to sort of write a, an equation that represents an element losing electrons, the electron should always end up on the product side. And when this happens, that is what is referred to as a cation. Uh, if we look here, magnesium will typically lose two electrons. So you would have magnesium that has no charge. When it loses two electrons, it would give up two electrons. And once again, our two electrons would be on the product side in this case. Aluminum uh, would be plus three, so it would lose three electrons. If you wanted to actually give a name to the actual ion, to the guy that has a positive charge, the way that we do that is essentially we just use the name of the element. So this ion here, if we had to name it, that would be the sodium ion. And you would just put ion at the end of it because it has a charge. This ion here would be the magnesium ion. So anything that's a positive ion, that's a cation and you need to give a name, it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty much just the name of the element and you just lay up ion at the end of it. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> now an anion as we've been talking about are when things basically gain electrons. So we could also represent this with an equation. So if we took chlorine and it gained one electron, it would end up with a chlorine with a minus one charge. Different than what we see with the cation in an anion situation, the electrons are on the reactant side, the left-hand side of the arrow. So if you needed to write an equation to represent somebody gaining an electron, the electron should always be on the left-hand side of the arrow. Uh, so if you had something like sulfur plus two electrons, gives us a minus two charge. Once again, our sulfur would have two electrons being gained on the left-hand side. Now, the way that we actually name something that is a negative ion is we actually use the kind of base of the name but we drop the last part and we add IDE to it. So chlorine, we drop the last part and add IDE. So that is the chloride ion. So right there, hang on, turn. Here, this is sulfur. We drop the last part and this becomes the sulfide ion, IDE. If you had oxygen that had a negative two charge, drop the last part, and this becomes the oxide ion. So negative ions are anions when they do develop a negative charge, and you are simply just naming the negative anion by itself. You drop the last part of the name and you put IDE at the end of it. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> That is, again, how we get something like this, which is NaCl. That is actually a sodium ion. 
and a chloride ion together. And that is why this is known as sodium chloride in this case. So separately, uh, if we're naming something that's positive and something that's negative, and they are separated not together, then again, we follow these rules. And when we put them together, we also follow the rules with some other things sort of attached to it. Now, when we look at the periodic table, as we've talked about, things on the periodic table do not have charges. They really only gain charges when they start coming together. And really only when metals and non-metals come together did they actually do gain charges. But there are certain charges that things typically will form so really everybody in group one typically will form a plus one charge. Everybody in group two will form a plus two charge. Skipping the kind of the middle section, but really aluminum here, plus three is the one that you see the most. Uh, we do skip four because that's sort of where the staircase comes down. And at number five, it's negative three for the non-metals that are in group five. Group six, it is minus two. And group seven, it is minus one. So we kind of go plus one, plus two, plus three, skip. Minus three, minus two, minus one. So again, our metals are typically the ones that will lose electrons and make a positive charge. Our non-metals are typically the ones that will gain electrons and make a negative charge. There's no good pattern in, in kind of group four because above the uh, staircase there, you have non-metals. Below it, you actually have metals happening. Most transition metals, as it says there, can make a variety of charges. There are three exceptions in the transition metal region that do make sort of a fixed charge, and that is zinc and cadmium. These guys always make a plus two charge. And then if you hang a left that cadmium to silver, that guy is always plus one. So although those three are kind of this backwards L here, Although they are transition metals, they also have a fixed charge when they do make a charge. Questions on that there? <clears throat> so compounds that uh, pure substances are very poor conductors of electricity. Uh, but when we do dissolve something in water and it does really form ions. Uh, these are what are called electrolytes. And electrolytes can be strong electrolytes or weak electrolytes. So if you have a strong electrolyte, it will 100% break apart in water into ions and conduct electricity really, really well. Uh, so, for example, if you had some sodium chloride solution, in solution, what happens is it really is the sodium ion and the chloride ion that break apart. And 100% of what you have in that beaker are basically those ions floating around. Because there's such a lot of ions floating around, it helps complete the circuit and conduct electricity really, really well. So, if you had a light bulb, attached to some electrodes and you put it into that beaker, the light bulb would go off really, really bright. So it'd be able to conduct electricity and really power the light bulb because of those ions that are present. It's 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 similar. Those those are electrolytes because they're really some ions and, and nutrients that we need to sort of help us power stuff, uh, some of the reactions and stuff like that. It, it's it's a similar sort of similar idea. You know, they're also called electrolytes, like where you get Gatorade, right? We play it for your electrolytes and stuff like that. So in our body, right, we have certain ions and stuff floating around that are needed to I won't say power, but sort of needed for certain reactions and processes that take place and stuff like that. So in general, if you have something like this as a strong electrolyte, you pretty much have none of the whole unit still together. So if you took some sodium chloride solution, uh, you would have none of the sodium and the chlorine together. It would all be 100% broken apart and be able to conduct electricity. There's also weak electrolytes, which mainly stay together. But uh, does produce 
some ions. So for example, if you took hydrofluoric acid, which is a weak acid, it would break apart into H plus and F minus in solution. But in solution, you would mainly have the HF unit sealed together, but you would produce a few ions in solution. Now, because you're still able to produce a few ions in solution, it's still able to conduct electricity, but it's not able to conduct anywhere near what a strong electrolyte could do. So again, if you took like the electrode with the light bulb and you put it into a weak electrolyte solution, the light bulb would come on, but it'd be like super dim, like it's almost dying, kind of dim. It wouldn't be very bright at all, but it's still enough ions in there to help conduct electricity and it will conduct a little. The last one is really a, a non-electrolyte and a non-electrolyte will not create ions in solution. It will dissolve, but it won't create any ions. And because it doesn't create any ions, it will not conduct electricity. So if you take something like sugar, sugar is carbons, hydrogen, and oxygen. When it goes and it dissolves, no problem, but it actually stays together. It doesn't break apart into ions or anything like that. So the solution has really no positive or negative charges in there to help it conduct electricity. So again, if you put like the electrode in that had the light bulb on it, the light bulb wouldn't turn on. It wouldn't be able to conduct electricity and stuff like that. <clears throat> so what helps it sort of conduct electricity is the presence of those ions that are floating around in the solution. And with the lack of it, you know, you would not. By the way, if I had pure, pure water, nothing else, is it a good or bad conductor of electricity? It's a really bad conductor of electricity, right? Because it's just water. It's hydrogen and oxygen bonded together. There's no ions. Just so we're clear, the water comes out of your pipe like in your shower is not pure water. Yes. They actually put ions in it to clean it. So you will electrocute yourself if you try to blow dry your hair in there. Yeah. So don't do that. Um, but if you had pure, pure water, it actually is a bad conductor of electricity because it doesn't have any ions in it. Yeah, exactly. Our deionized water is ions basically taken out. So here, pure, pure water, no nothing floating around in it uh, will not conduct electricity and a little bit of salt, which is sodium chloride, which would have sodium ions and chloride ions floating around, will be able to conduct electricity. And as you can see, we'll turn the light bulb on. So a strong electrolyte will make that thing br very bright. A weak electrolyte still turn on because there's a little bit of ions and it'll be dim. Non-electrolyte, you will not get any sort of power happening to it. <clears throat> All right, last thing here that I want to talk about to wrap up this chapter is when we actually put ions together, and we'll talk more about it in a later chapter when we talk actually about nomenclature, but just a little preview. When we actually put ions together to write a chemical formula, we always want to make sure that the ions equal zero. So you want to put the ions together, the positive and the negative charge, in the simplest way that will give it an overall charge of zero. So if I was putting a sodium ion and a chloride ion together, that's plus one and minus one. So we really just need one of each of those to do it. But if I was doing something like what we see down here, barium with a plus two, oxide with a minus two, plus two, minus two, just need one of each to get to zero. When I take aluminum and sulfide, One's a plus three and one's a minus two. If I just put them together one to one, I will end up with an overall charge of plus one, right? So the common number between three and two is six. So to get aluminum to six, I need two of them. To get this guy to six, I need three of them. Gives me a minus six and a plus six. So that equals zero. So the correct formula here should be Al2S3. Three of the sulfur sulfides and two of the aluminums. And then same thing here, if we look at potassium, which has a plus one charge and phosphide that has a minus three charge, we actually need three total of these guys to balance out the negative three charge that we see here. And that gives us three potassiums and one phosphide. Now, sometimes people are learned to do the bring the charge down type of deal or bring the subscript up to write your formulas and it will work you know 90 some odd percent of the time it will not work 100 percent of the time so if you just blindly move the charges like that 
not a great idea because you won't always get the right formula. So it's always good to kind of think about it like a math problem. I need how many of each to kind of balance it out to zero. But whenever you do a positive and negative guy, the overall charge of the actual formula should be zero. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right, so that should wrap up chapter four.